Historic tragedies are not just events of their day. Think of slavery, the Holocaust, residential schools. They leave legacies, enduring sometimes for centuries, as descendants contend with the repercussions of historical trauma. How can we understand the impact of such events on those who live in the wake of them? To help us explore that, we are joined on the line from New Haven, Connecticut by Miroslav Wolf. He is professor of theology, Yale University Divinity School, and the author of The End of Memory, Remembering Rightly in a Violent World. And here in our studio, Quam McKenzie, CEO of the Wellesley Institute and Director of Health Equity at CAMH, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. Marta Marine Domin, Director of the Center for Memory and Testimony Studies at Wilfrid Laurier University. And we welcome back Robert Jan van Pelt, University Professor in the Department of Architecture and the co-author of The Evidence Room. And it is uh, lovely to see you two here. Uh, you for the first time, I believe. Quam, great to see you again. Uh, Professor Wolf, nice to have you on the line from Connecticut. Quam, I want you to, we need a good psychiatrist here, to help us understand the difference between personal trauma and historical trauma. Help us out. Well, when I think of uh, personal trauma, I think of things that have happened to you. Uh, so traumas, you know, you have been a witness or you have been a part of a traumatic experience. And when I think of historical trauma, I think of traumas that have, you haven't necessarily uh, been a witness to, you haven't necessarily experienced, but have been passed down to you. Uh, they're things that have happened to your culture or your group. They're things that may have happened to your father or your father's fathers or your mother's mother, but they've been passed down to you either through culture uh, and sometimes people think even through your genes. I think somebody sitting beside you may have some personal experience at this. Okay, Marta. You're from... Now, do I say you're from Spain or do I say you're from Catalonia? This is a good question. Don't get me going into that. <laughs> Particularly at this time. Well, I think that answer suggests that um, a lot of the history of that part of the world has been visited on you. How so? Yes, actually, I'm the daughter of a father who went to exile after the Spanish Civil War. So I know a bit about that, how... Uh, trauma passes from one generation to the other. And actually, uh, I'm about to publish a book about that. Why did he go into exile? He was part of the uh, defeated side. The Republicans? Uh, the Republicans. My family were anarchists. And so they had to uh, go to exile. Picking up on Quinn McKenzie's yes. comments, that all happened to him. Yes. The historical trauma mm -hmm. is what has befallen you. How has all of that affected you? <laughs> well, I'm here. I'm in Canada. I don't think this is a frivolous answer. I think exile expresses in many ways, depending on each subject. And I think for me, it has been always um, kind of disquieting feeling in Spain. So this is why I decided to leave. But this is too personal, right? I don't know if that makes uh, for a paradigm or a model to express explain how trauma passes from one generation to another. But to some extent, yes, I believe. Can I, can I jump into Please. that? Because uh, my mother is a Holocaust survivor. And so I grew up in the Netherlands, which had a, uh, you know, a very savage German occupation in which uh, family members of mine ended up in Auschwitz, which is one of the reasons I studied the site. And I remember very well that every time that I came to England, because we had family in England as a boy, the moment I got, we arrived in Harwich, that I had this sense of liberation because I literally entered on soil that had not been occupied and that had not been submitted to the test that my countrymen, the Dutch, had so clearly failed between 1940 and 45. So I must say that when, when Martha says that, you know, the, the answer is I'm here in Canada, I decided that after I had moved to England as a student, uh, uh, to, to be at the University of London, that I could never go back to the European continent mm -hmm. for the very reason that I couldn't breathe there. Well, let's go to get a story from the European continent. Miroslav, you were born in what uh, I guess today we call the former Yugoslavia. How have the events there of the last couple of decades had an impact on whatever historical trauma may be engaged in your life? Well, um... Uh, the, the events of the last uh, two decades go ob obviously back uh, long, long in, in history, but the uh, way in which my life is in particularly, uh, particularly connected with those events 
is that um, I too am a, a survivor. My father uh, w was one of the uh, many after World War II who uh, participated, who was uh, who was pulled into uh, death marches and labor labor camps and uh, survived in survived in a miraculous kind of a way. Uh, you, you know the, the strange story is that he had discovered love. In fact, he has discovered he he said the God of love in the midst of uh, what was unspeakable uh, hell. And that story, his story, has shaped, uh, of course, uh, my life. Um, and in some ways, I myself have been then uh, interrogated when I grew up uh, by the regime that oppressed uh, oppressed him, and uh, in the same city in which we, he partly experienced that, uh, that that traumatization. So the kind of remembering, how does one remember what has transpired, is very much part and parcel of who I am. But also, this is more directly and indirectly. Obviously, I'm a, I'm a Croatian of a kind of German uh, German extraction, and the events of the past uh, uh, past decades uh, have had profound impact on uh, how we relate to one another. And even when I have not suffered trauma, my people uh, have, and I have to figure out where I fit in the story of my people and story of my people uh, with other peoples. Uh, uh, which was the cause of the conflict. Now, Marta's trauma has been so profound that she had to leave Spain. Uh, are you able to go back to the Balkans? Uh, yes, yes, I, I haven't left uh, the Balkans um, because of uh, because of the trauma, and partly I think uh, it, it's very interesting because my father's very explicit decision was not to leave, uh, not to leave then Yugoslavia, and I think it's partly related with the idea that what's associated that space is associated with him with immense, immense suffering. But at the same time, with kind of discovery that more fundamental that that suffering is is a is a kind of a world of justice. He would describe even world of love that made it possible for him to actually live there when he had opportunity to leave for United States. Uh, and uh, I think I kind of follow in my father's uh, footstep, footsteps uh, until I realized that I actually couldn't do the kind of academic work I wanted to do uh, in former Yugoslavia and then moved to. Uh, uh, to Germany and then to the States. Understood. Let us uh, play a clip at this point. We want to get another voice on this conversation. This is Nalo Hopkinson, who's a Canadian science fiction writer. We'll play a snippet of this interview and then come back and chat. Roll it, please, Sheldon. Two years back, I went to um, a travel agency. There are magazines on the wall, and they're all about cruises. And I'm not even thinking. I open up one of them, and there's a cutaway of the ship and the sleeping berths. And what I'm seeing is a cutaway of the slave ships. You know those pictures you've seen. Of, I had to. I had to step outside. It. It. It was just such a powerful aversion reaction to something fairly simple. It's like, no, here's where you'd be sleeping. And my first thought was, no way, <laughs> I'm not going on a cruise. I know what happens when we go on big ships. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the logical part of me knows, I mean, sure, I'd, I'd go on a cruise if I didn't think I'd throw up for three months. But that reaction is primal. Now, Quam, she's laughing, but clearly there is something almost genetic about the memory that keeps past suffering emotionally alive for her. Can you explain that? So, I, we don't know whether it's genetic or not, but we do know is that uh, trauma can affect your genes and uh, it can affect... Uh, I think the easiest way of looking at it is to say that what our genes and what our brain's trying to do is make us perfectly adapted to uh, the environment we're in. So if something pretty traumatic happens to us or something traumatic happens to our people, we've got to have a memory of that somewhere because we've got to say, well, you know, if that happens again, we've got to work out how we're going to deal with it. We've got to be adaptable. Mm -hmm. Now, some of those memories are going to be hard memories. They're going to be memories that may change the way your genes express themselves. Some of them are going to be cultural memories. Uh, but what they give you is an opportunity to uh, be able to respond appropriately in the right uh, circumstances. Marta, does that ring true for you? Yeah, yeah, completely. 
But I was thinking uh, through your explanation, which I completely agree, my question would be to know if there is a way to cut this path. Because do we want to be just to surrender to this inheritance? Is there any way to give up that? Because um, to be all the time living under the position of the traumatic subject or the victim, I don't think is a good way to live either, right? So, uh, for instance, I would give you, and sorry to be personal, to personal, my first gesture was to go to live in France because that was where my family went. But I thought, no, this is too much identification. I'm going to change completely. Too much identification. Identification with my family past. I see. So what am I going to do there, to repeat? So, uh, I mean, I would answer that uh, what nature likes giving us is opportunities. Mm -hmm. It gives us tools and it gives us opportunities, uh, but it doesn't doom us from the womb. It gives us opportunities and then it depends what happens. And so we can have lots of different people who uh, experience the same trauma, but the, uh, the way uh, they deal with it is different. And so are we hostage always to our past? No, um, but uh, can we be hostage to our past if a set of circumstances occur that uh, mean that we think that, well, actually, um, you know, that way of uh, reacting or acting is, is useful for us? Well, sure. Let me bring another voice into the conversation. This is Elie Wiesel. And Robert Young, you know I'm going to go to you first here. Elie Wiesel writing in uh, The Kingdom of Memory in 1990. We remember Auschwitz and all that it symbolizes because we believe that in spite of the past and its horrors, the world is worthy of salvation. And salvation, like redemption, can be found only in memory. How essential do you think it is, Robert Young, to retrieve the suffering of our past to know who we are today. Now, I think that, uh, I, I actually, I just I wanted to quote another Elie Wiesel mm -hmm. uh, statement, and, and this has to do with the centrality of the survivor experience uh, in the, let's call it, in the Jewish people. You know, we, uh, we are a self-defined survivor, survivor people. And Elie Wiesel said that, you know, God did not give man, woman, the secret of how to begin, but how the secret of how to begin again. And that the story of paradise is not about Adam and Eve, you know, doing something bad with the tree of knowledge uh, and life, but it is that when they were kicked out of paradise, that they basically, you know, started to make a new life, that they got children, that they started to work. And I think that, uh, but they did not lose the memory of paradise. You know, they did that very clearly, otherwise the Bible would not uh, basically have that story. They did it with full consciousness of what was there behind them. Mm. And I think that Milton, uh, you know, describes at the end of Paradise Lost, those moments of departure, but still looking back. They're looking back at where they have been, and that allows them the, the act of beginning again. And I would say that, uh, that I think the whole, the whole remarkable story uh, of Holocaust survivors in general and Auschwitz survivors in particular, if we go back to the particular reference to Auschwitz, uh, it, that the fact that they could make a new life is because they did not forget. Quinn. Yeah, I, I totally agree that uh, it's important for us to remember, uh, but it's also important for some things for us to forget. Uh, and there's a difference between building on the past and being a hostage to the past. And there are some uh, uh, cultures where they say, uh, we walk backwards into the past, into the future, sorry. We walk, we walk backwards, backwards into, into the future. The future. Mm -hmm. So we are looking at the past, and we're sometimes looking at the present, but we're so fixed on that, we're not looking at the future. And that's fine, but you can stumble. And I, I'm not saying people should uh, forget uh, but as long as you're not a hostage to the past, as long as you can build on the past, it becomes useful. And sometimes what you see is that people become a hostage to the past and it makes progress difficult. Miroslav, where are you on this? 
Well, uh, th this is a wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, line from Elie Wiesel that you've read about salvation being in memory. And I, I think it's true, but it's also a only a partial truth, I would want to say, echoing some of what has been said uh, before. My sense is also that we would have to say that perdition also lies in memory. In my part of the world, it is a certain evocation of memories that has led to the outbreak of hostilities in the name of struggle for, for justice. And so to me, that led me to reflect about kind of proper uses of, of memory um, and what we do uh, and how we, uh, how we remember and how we remember well. And uh, back to the earlier discussion uh, in, in terms of uh, kind of removing oneself from the, from the kind of sphere uh, that is imbued with memories, spatially, geographically, that, that, can, that can work. Sometimes I think that's also very useful to do uh, something like a backgrounding and foregrounding. I can background certain kinds of memory, foreground certain other uh, kinds of memories, and in this way live with memories. And I would want to develop the whole, if you want, the program of remembering well that includes a certain kinds of also forgetting, though I would say you cannot pass out of the trauma by simple act of forgetting. You have to work through it. Mm. Robert Jan. Yeah. Uh, I just wonder if, if we shouldn't just bring the elephant in the room right now. What is the elephant? The institutions. You know, we, <clears throat> when we took talk about, you know, personal memory or the memory in our family, mm. the memory, memory of our grandparents we inherit. But personally, I must say that, of course, my memory of the traumatic past that I might have inherited or the, the traumatic past that many people I know remember is actually created by institutions, by schools, universities, uh, by the environment in which we grew up, in which at a certain moment power relations are clearly introduced uh, in the case of, let's say, the, the, the former Yugoslavia, with the way the memory of Kosovo, the Battle of Kosovo, became, you know, highly mm. politicized uh, <clears throat> in the 1990s uh, on the Milosevic and so on. I think makes it clear that that uh, you know, I mean, what would politicians be without actually that ammunition of mm. historical memory? Well, when you talk about the Battle of Kosovo, you're talking about from 600 years ago. Yeah, yeah. So that the 14th brought... century, the yes. 14th century, yeah. which becomes one of the battle cries in a in a civil war, which has, as far as I'm as an outsider can say, of course, nothing to do with the Battle of Kosovo in the mid 14th century. Mm -hmm. Well, since you said civil war, I'm going back to Marta here. At at what point does your understandable suffering for the experiences of your father and the impact it has had on your life, and I'll pick up on what Quam had to say, at what point do you forgive me for the way I put this, okay? Yeah. At what point do you become a prisoner of all of that and and are you you know, at what point is enough enough? <laughs> you become a prisoner, yes. You are a prisoner of everything your family does, actually, mm -hmm. right? But um, I was very aware that something was happening since I was a kid, a five-year-old kid, because at a certain point, my parents used to talk in murmurs when passing certain places in Barcelona that Later on, I learned were places of execution, public execution, for instance. Um, well, it depends on each subject, how every each person is going to deal with that. Um, I learned a tool that is helping me a lot, which is writing and literature, which is the word, right? The word is therapeutic, and but not only that. The word allows you, in writing, for instance, to have a certain distance, and I think uh, reaching the point of being able to look at yourself and your family and your community at a certain distance is necessary to start remembering, but from a positive side, not mm -hmm. just with from the position of suffering. Just acknowledging what has passed is always going to be there. No healing for collective memory is there. Now, we might talk about what institutions might do into going into this acknowledging violence, for instance. Mm -hmm. But you have to deal with that, the distance that allows you from some reflection and maybe to live a little bit with some peace. But um, to uh, Robert Jan, I, I wanted to comment that, OK, well, we have to acknowledge what has passed. But what happens in communities, and to you too, where uh, the memory has not been acknowledged? 
And mm. this we have a collective problem. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd agree there's this uh, working through that you can do and making sense you can do uh, yourself that uh, moves you forward. Uh, but then there's constructed narrative, uh, which can be through, um, you know, institutions, uh, but can also be through resistance. So when things have not been acknowledged, when it's clear that, that the suffering hasn't been validated, that you can develop a resistance and there's a community you can develop a resistance to the narrative that you're given, because it doesn't make sense. I'm interested in yeah. that expression, though, of working through. Robert Jan, how many times have you been to Auschwitz? I think 200 times. Yeah. 200 times? Yeah, I've done this for 30 years, so that's... Uh... Do, do you think... Are, are you still continuing to work through all of the historical trauma that your family has experienced there? No, ex actually, um, yes and no. I mean, the, the, I originally went uh, in search of an uncle who was killed there and who gave me my name. Uh, so the issue that you raised, my name actually is important uh, in that sense. And, uh, and I did find him in a sense there, which I found him in my work. Totally agree with Marta. It is literally, it is in the work itself that my therapy is. <clears throat> the, the thing is that uh, it is incredible privilege. I, I mean, I think that that is the, 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 the uh, to, be, to be given a task, to be burdened with a task of this magnitude is one, I think, of the greatest privileges you can receive as a human being. I think that these traumas, to only talk about them as a burden, I think would be, uh, would, would actually, uh, to, to, to uh, underestimate the positive impact they have in shaping our life. It is, you know, it is in some way the anvil and the hammer, and, and we need both of them to ultimately become a usable piece of equipment in this world. <laughs> And Mir Miroslav, I'm going to ask you to follow up in this regard. We've talked a lot about suffering here tonight so far. And, you know, the, the largest, I guess the largest uh, cohort of religious people in our society are Christians. And the image of Christ on the cross suffering, I mean, is that, is that the source of the emphasis on suffering in Western culture, in your view? Well, um... You know, uh, uh, Western history uh, of engagement with the, with the problem of uh, of suffering. I mean, it certainly goes as far back as uh, as the exodus of the children of Israel uh, from the slavery slavery in Egypt, as far as the Book of Job, uh, righteous sufferer, and certainly I think the the story of the of Christ on the cross plays uh, plays a significant role. And I think it has been used. It has been also misused, but I think it has been used. In in a significant, uh, significant ways, I think, in a sense that we uh, can find somebody, that those who suffer can find somebody to whom, uh, with whom to identify, to turn our gaze also to those uh, who suffer, to remember and retell their stories. But for me, uh, as I was thinking about the question of how do I remember, remember rightly, and kind of right remembering uh, of the Exodus, the remembering, I remember that, uh, that we were slaves, uh, we Christians say that as well, remember that we were slaves so that we wouldn't oppress uh, those uh, who are marginalized in our groups. And in terms of Christ's own suffering, it's both solidarity with suffering, but it's also uh, a kind of a sense of redemptive, uh, redemptive memory uh, so that what I remember in his suffering is the redemption that comes out of this. And I think it was mentioned earlier that suffering and traumas need not necessarily be only negative. Um, they can be very much productive. And the question for me is always, how does suffering become productive and how do memories uh, uh, work in such a way as to make possible a new life, a reconciled uh, life, a life that doesn't simply look back, as it was mentioned earlier, but life that uh, imagines that something new is really, really possible. And I think that's inscribed uh, somehow in that story uh, of the suffering of Christ, uh, if one reads it again and remembers it from a particular angle. To that end, I want to bring in our remaining moments here one fifth voice into our conversation one last time. This is Dr. Suzanne Stewart. 
Uh, Quam, I don't know if you know her. She's uh, a. Yeah, I, yeah, I figured you lovely. would. Yeah, Indigenous Health uh, yes. Professor, University of Toronto. Yeah, super on, smart. On this uh, program, uh, very recently, talking about truth and reconciliation from an Indigenous point of view. Let's hear what she had to say on that. Sheldon, roll the clip, please. In order to work together, uh, the damaged relationship between Indigenous peoples and uh, non-Indigenous Canadians uh, needs to be addressed, and that is through what's commonly referred to nowadays as reconciliation, which is an act that's being taken up federally, provincially, locally, by schools, by school boards, by universities, by corporations. And reconciliation really means um, addressing the harms that have been perpetrated on Indigenous peoples by the systems in which we currently live and work. And for Indigenous people, reconciliation is about healing from our own wounds, from the trauma that's been inflicted by the policies that have affected each of us on a very personal level. Professor Suzanne Stewart on this program last week. Marta, do you think the pain caused by historical trauma can be healed on a personal level? Um, I'm not completely sure about that because what is done is done. But certainly being, um, suffering being acknowledged publicly and politically might help into recovering. And I think maybe we need to talk a lot more about suffering and trauma and trauma from a perspective that is political as well, not only psychological or social, because um, powers have many things to do when facing past violent events. And may I just say something about truth and reconciliation, which is interesting, these uh, two words. From my perspective, they are spoken from the side of the power, because truth, the victim knows it perfectly. The victim knows the truth. It's exactly. the perpetrators who exactly. need to know the truth. No, as a community, as a country, how we are going to deal not only with the terrible memories of people who went through residential schools, but to some other uh, memories. Well, we have slavery, we yeah. have Armenians, we have the Chinese population that were forced to work on the railroad, etc. Yeah. So, okay, the truth is known by those communities and some other people, but what to do? And if we are capable of doing something politically, maybe we can jump into reconciliation because Maybe we need something in between. Well, let me talk, uh, I'm going to ask Quam to talk about this because uh, those two words, truth and reconciliation, perhaps best became known because of what happened in South Africa. What do you think all these years later has been accomplished as a result of that process there? I, I think that uh, when I think of South Africa, I remember uh, speaking many, many years ago to Desmond Tutu who was talking about the Truth and Reconciliation Committee there. And he was saying that um, people would come to the Truth and Reconciliation Committee to hear, uh, to hear people confess to what had happened. And they started off wanting uh, something done to that person. They wanted that person to, uh, to in some way, suffer. And uh, he said that, I remember him saying that the transformative moment he had in the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission was when somebody said, <clears throat> the best thing I can do for me here is to forgive you. Forgive the perpetrator. Forgive the perpetrator. Now, when it comes to truth and reconciliation here, I think uh, there's just a huge amount of things that need to be done at a structural level. I think that we've got a commission, we've got over 90 recommendations and we should move on them. I think that uh, there is huge inequalities, there's poverty, there are people dying and we need to move on those and we need to give people, we need to think about those treaty rights and actually keep to them. Uh, but I do think at an individual level there's something else about uh, how you can live um, with the historical trauma without it eating you. I want to get Miroslav on that because I think you have lived in Germany at some point in your life, Miroslav, and I wonder what your perception is of how Germans have dealt with their efforts at truth and reconciliation vis-a-vis -vis the Jewish people in the world. 
what generally people people think and praise uh, Germans is uh, a, a kind of uh, in conjunction with the truth, a uh, question of truth, uh, that is a, a common commissions of, of, write, of writing common history. And that seems to me to underscore in a profound way um, the, the importance of kind of agreement on what has uh, transpired because as long as there is no agreement of what has transpired, or at least some kind of adjustment of perspectives, nothing like reconciliation is possible. And I think that's because to be untruthful in the context of, 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 uh, of um, atrocity or injury is to be injurious and commit to commit atrocity. Mm -hmm. And that's why we care so profoundly, uh, profoundly for, for truth. Um, uh, and yet we cannot simply live with the perspective, well, I know the truth, uh, and the other side simply has to submit to my account of the truth. So it has to be a kind of negotiated understanding of what the truth is. Otherwise, uh, I, I think uh, one perspective will win and perpetrators will kind of repeat themselves in, in a certain way. Robert Young, for a victim to heal, is it necessary that a perpetrator be punished? Um, no, I don't think so. I, I think it was very helpful for, I would say generally, for uh, if I may speak on behalf now of the Jewish experience, I think it was very helpful that Germany was uh, badly beaten up in 1945. I think it was very helpful that they lived in two states for a long time. Uh, in that sense, I think that the remarkable, and I think it's an absolutely remarkable, if not a unique, reconciliation that has generally taken place between, let's call it, the German and the Jewish peoples, um, uh, and, and which I've experienced uh, very often in Germany. I mean, there's no country I, I, I would like to live in but Germany today. Mm -hmm. And that is because my work has been really supported in Germany, and there is a desire for the truth there. Uh, and, 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 and the most important thing is that actually there is a, there's a new generation, or there be now two generations of people who are well-educated. Yeah, and you can, really can make an argument about education. But I do think that, that the fact that they lost the war badly, that they went through at least 30 to 50 very tough years, that the, re, that the reunification <clears throat> in some way was an, 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 a remarkable, I think, political act, a generous political act on the side of the West Germans also, the way they dealt with East Germany, uh, I think made it also possible for former victims mm -hmm. to be at peace with the Germany that exists now. Uh, I don't want us to lose our satellite, which we're going to any second now, before I have a chance to thank our guest who's been there on the line from New Haven, Connecticut, Miroslav Wolf, the professor of theology at Yale University, the Divinity School. Uh, if you want more on this, his book, The End of Memory, Remembering Rightly in a Violent World, uh, is recommended reading for this. Uh, Miroslav, thank you for being there for us on the line from the U.S. today. Appreciate your contribution. It's, it was a pleasure. And to our guests here in Toronto, Marta Marine Domin, Director of the Center for Memory and Testimony Studies at Wilfrid Laurier University, Quam McKenzie, the CEO of the Wellesley Institute, Director of Health Equity at CAMH, and Robert Jan van Pelt, University Professor in the Department of Architecture, co-author of The Evidence Room, which we recommend everybody sees at the Royal Ontario Museum. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.